Hello everybody, welcome to Oscar Rusty Bucket. Subscribe to the channel if you have not already and drop a like on this video. It only takes one second. It makes a massive difference in how the video performs in the YouTube algorithm. So I'm obviously a little bit late on all this stuff, but I'm, you know, getting around to it now. As for why it took me so long to react to a lot of this news, um, being lazy. So the Houston Rockets had a very interesting off season. It'd be kind of hard for me to grade the off season they had because from what I understand, they had a fantastic draft. Uh, they got uh, the, one of the Thompson twins to be a future guard for them, as well as I think his name is Cam Whitmore, who fell in the draft. I still haven't heard why he fell so significantly, but they managed to get two, I believe, top 10 projected prospects for like what they're, I think the fifth or fourth pick as I think you know, the fourth pick, as well as like the 20 something pick or like 18th or whatever. So definitely a very good draft for the Houston Rockets, but then they get into free agency and they made two major signings that I find quite questionable and of course those were Fred Van Vliet as well as Dylan Brooks now on principle signing these guys is not a problem um, it's more so a problem when you give them all of the money like all of it like every dollar that there's ever been because that's what it certainly felt like at least of course relative to the quality of players these guys are Fred Van Vliet got a little over 43 million dollars a year somewhere in that ballpark for a two plus one, which granted, when this contract came out, it initially seemed as though it was explicitly a three year deal. A two plus one, the plus one being a team option, is significantly more manageable. So you do have to take that into account. Um, and I believe Dylan Brooks's deal is a three plus one, but for $20 million a year. Now, I do think a lot of people haven't quite made the adjustment in their head that $20 million a year is like you know just decent to good starter range money like you know Robert Covington a couple of years ago would get 20 million dollars now you know like when he got 12 back in the day like 20 is the new 12 essentially so with that in mind yeah I do think some people have overreacted to these contracts I would say the same for Fred making 40 like yeah at this point if you're a top 50 player you are in the ballpark for 40 million dollars a year now maybe Fred debatable isn't top 50 anymore but he was definitely two years ago so I understand that and I do think there's an argument to be made that Fred's down year could very easily be recovered from but you could also make the argument maybe he doesn't handle a change of environment and more responsibility on, on top of the money being the reason I have issue with some of these moves I also don't love what it means for the young players like what does it mean for the guard that you just drafted that you then immediately signed a starting point guard who was an all-star two years ago to a two-year deal. Uh, I am a big believer in experience is the best teacher. So if you have your guy sitting on the bench even 10 minutes a game that he otherwise wouldn't have been had you not signed Fred Van Vliet, that's 10 minutes a game over two, maybe three seasons that could have been utilized to improve that player and it slows down his trajectory. Now, now, there is an argument as well to be made that having a veteran guard there, having someone who has seen the highs and lows of the NBA, won a championship, made an all-star team, all that, could make for a valuable mentor, but... I, I just don't want to spend $40 million a year on a mentor, and I also don't want that mentor to take away minutes and shots away from my young point guard. So there's that factor, but as for Dylan Brooks specifically, uh, it's no secret that I don't like Dylan Brooks, so when I say things like, I think Dylan Brooks absolutely stinks, uh, a lot of people, naturally, and I say fairly, would be like, well, you're just biased, you just don't like Dylan Brooks, and that's true, I don't. Um, but he also does suck and that's entirely separate from my personal bias in this instance because most metrics suggest that Dylan Brooks sucks now I'm not necessarily the biggest fan of plus minus in the world but in the case of a player who it's being argued his impact is not in the stat sheet especially given how ugly his stats can look when you take efficiency into account if that's the case you would hope that at the very least least the advanced stats suggest Dylan Brooks is a good player. Like, for example, I remember early in Lonzo Ball's career, his, his numbers were bad like he had a good assist and rebound stuff decent assist to turnover ratio but his scoring was gross 
uh, like terrible, terrible, terrible efficiency. Couldn't hit threes early on in his career. No rim gravity whatsoever. No mid-range game. Couldn't score the ball. Uh, so aesthetically, for a lot of reasons, you would see Lonzo on the floor and it would kind of look like, ugh, this guy's not very good. But then you would take a look at the advanced stats and the Lakers were a significantly better team when Lonzo Ball was on the floor. Meanwhile, take a look at Dylan Brooks. He has been a net negative for his entire career. There might be one or two seasons where he was a net positive earlier on, but where he's at now the past few years, he has been a not significant negative in the regular season, but definitely a negative impact basketball player. And when you go to the postseason, the drop off is even more significant. He was nearly a negative four and plus minus in the postseason two years ago, and he was a negative seven versus the loss. Los Angeles Lakers and of course if you take a look at those last two playoff years versus the Warriors in 2022 a lot of people would argue that Dylan Brooks was the reason they lost that series and you can definitely strongly make that argument in the case of the Lakers series now in my personal opinion I think the Lakers and the Warriors were going to win that series anyways. They were my original pick to win those series both times, and it didn't necessarily surprise me that it went the way that it did. But Dylan made matters worse. When you are already facing an uphill battle, having someone completely throwing the game while you're doing it is not a good way to win that uphill battle. You would be hard pressed to convince me that Dylan Brooks is worth $5 million a year, let alone 20, because I personally only like positive basketball players to be on my team, especially for $20 million, no less. Uh, yeah, Dylan can play good defense. Now, half of the time that's just because he's fouling people and even as much as he gets called for his fouls he still gets away with lots of them but he is the first non-big man in NBA history to lead the league in fouls so already the dude's just insanely physical to a degree that is not even really allowed in basketball which puts his team in foul trouble which is of course a huge disadvantage to have for stopping a team because then even a reaching foul once you get into the bonus gets Gets them to the freaking free throw line. I don't know if you know how basketball works. So hurts them in that regard. So I don't even know that he's necessarily that impactful as a defender. I think he's often overrated in that regard. The only times I really see him play lockdown, lockdown defense is when getting away with a lot of physicality. Now that can be said for a lot of defenders. So it's not necessarily strictly a Dylan Brooks thing. But uh, yeah, I don't think he's actually that excellent defensively. Uh, he's made all defensive teams, but I think there are a couple of forwards you can find who play better defense than Dylan Brooks and don't do the stupid shit that Dylan Brooks does, which is take 17 shots to get 15 points. The guy's shot selection is disgusting. Now, I will give Dylan this one caveat. If he decided to just cut that shit out and just be a catch and shoot guy, finish layouts and dunks on the fast break, occasional backdoor cut, but ultimately completely, completely cut those mid-range shots out of his game. From that point, I could see Dylan Brooks being a good basketball player, worth $20 million dollars i don't know about that but a good basketball player a positive basketball player but to this point he has not shown that ability and while i would be okay with like a five mil bet that he would figure that out and suddenly be the good player that he is capable of being dylan might be worth that money eventually but he's not and i don't think he's going to do that and personally i'm not banking 60 to 80 million dollars on the possibility that he will change your defense Defense doesn't matter to me if you are a complete negative offensively who takes up a large percentage of that offense. I've seen the argument made a handful of times, and it's one that has been made for the likes of like Matisse Thibel, who we seem to come around to realize that player is not worth it. But take Matisse Thibel, and then instead of him shooting the ball four times a game, have him shoot the ball 13 times a game. Like, that's disgusting. It's the 
the worst. It is terrible, terrible, terrible offense. Like it's one thing if you can't score. It's another thing if you can't score, but you think you can. So you take shots as though you can score. Once you have reached that territory, you are a significant negative player. I don't care if you are Scottie Pippen on the other end defensively. I don't want you on my basketball team. So I just don't like that signing for Houston. I wouldn't have liked that signing for anyone. And especially speaking of anyone, who was giving Dylan Brooks this money? Who else was going to offer Dylan Brooks $20 million a year? Who else was going to offer Fred Van Vliet $43 million a year? I don't know. Now, I, I do think people overreact to bad contracts. So I'm not going to sit here and pretend like they fucked themselves here. Uh, ultimately, in terms of just playing good basketball, Fred Van Vliet is going to help them be a better basketball team. And, you know, hopefully it doesn't hinder development too significantly. But I, it just feels wholly unnecessary. Now, I do want to throw out there, I probably should have said this earlier. Um, there is a contract, like an amount of money minimum that the new CBA has added. So teams can't just not spend their cap space. They have to sign people to a certain threshold of money. And by signing Dylan and Fred, they managed to fill a bunch of cap that otherwise would have been empty cap space. But at that point, I would just rather sign a couple of guys, a handful of role players to one year deals for probably a little bit too much money for each of them. But it's a one year deal. So it's ultimately inc inconsequential to your long term goals. But now instead, uh, you have a lot of money locked into these players long term, you know, a year from now is Fred Van Vliet maybe going to be on the trade block? Sure. Uh, but I, I just feel like it was unnecessary to go this direction in terms of signing players. I would have much rather seen a couple of, uh, couple of vets that are, you know, making $10 million a year and ultimately would make you a better basketball team and would elevate those young players rather than potentially getting in their way. That said, Houston's going to be an interesting team and they have not been interesting or remotely fun to watch at all in the last year. So I am excited to see that turn around. They ultimately improved. There's no doubt about that, but I do think that improvement could come at somewhat of a cost to their future. And again, Dylan Brooks for that much money, man. I just don't get it. But yeah, that is it. Shout out to Rudy for editing this video and goodbye.